Praise the Lord. Um, if you got the, your Bible this morning, um, let me just get um, the exact reading. Exact, Exodus chapter 4 this morning. Exodus chapter 4. We're going to break into this story this morning um, when Moses was 80 years of age and after he had went through 40 years in the wilderness and basically he's coming out of his wilderness experience in Exodus 4, 10 through 12 and God draws very close to him and talks to him and this is where he's actually ready to receive from God. Now listen to the interaction between Moses and God here. Exodus 4, verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither hitherto for, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf, or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Let us just pray. Lord, we just need you. We need you more than we ever needed you before, Lord. We recognize we're in a season where we're in a battle. We're in an intense battle. Lord, it's not in our imaginations. We, we just feel that, Lord, there's... There's an enemy that would love to destroy what's going on in this house. But Lord, this is not our work. This is your work. This is not our house. This is your house. This is not our word or our message. It's your message. Lord, this is not our day. This is your day. And Lord, I would just pray in your mighty name, O oh God, that you would speak this morning to each of us. Lord, that we would get perspective this morning. That we would know exactly what's going on. Lord, what we need to do as we go through this season. And I pray it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I've called this message this morning, God is trying to do something in you and through you, part nine. Now, if you've missed the other parts, parts one to eight, again, I'll say this, like I said last week, this is a standalone message. And I just ask that you would open up your hearts and your minds today just to receive what the Lord would say to you. Over this past few weeks, we have been considering the great news that God wants to do something in you and through you. You should count that a great honor today. The fact that God Almighty wants to work in you and through you. Um, we've looked at the main obstacle to that happening, and we've looked at God's remedy to deal with that. We've established that your most stubborn and unrelenting enemy is your sinful self your flesh. And God's remedy for that is the tests and the trials that we experience as we go through the fire and the wilderness. Now I can assure you there's nobody in this house this morning that would choose to go through the fire. There's nobody this morning in this house that would choose to go through a wilderness experience. It's just, honestly, it's just not who we are or it's not what we enjoy. But God brings the fire and God brings the wilderness in order to make you stronger in the midst of that. But even as a congregation, God's heart is always to, um, to make us as a congregation stronger. By the way, this is designed to expose your flesh and to purge your rebellious nature. As you come through this, you should despair of self-reliance. You should feel empty. You should be devoid of any confidence in what you can achieve, but ultimately it ends up what God wants for you. You see your absolute need of God. 
You see your absolute need of God to be and to do. Uh, you seek his presence more than anything else on this planet. There are a lot of benefits, and I'm going to pull up a slide here because I've never done this on a Sunday morning before. But there are a lot of benefits with drawing close to the Lord. And I want you just to uh, see this this morning. Um, you might actually start to see what's happening, where we're going um, in our studies over this past few weeks. So we talked about the flesh, our greatest enemy, uh, back at the very start. We talked about how God deals with that flesh, with the fire, with the wilderness. And we then talked about how that whenever we come out of the wilderness or the fire, that the one thing that we do desire more than anything is his presence. Now, this is what comes from the presence of God. Okay? We looked uh, three weeks ago, I believe, at what comes from his presence is his peace to comfort you. Then we looked last week at his power or his strength to achieve whatever he asks. This morning, we're going to look at his proclamations or the word of God to direct you. Um, as you can see, there's alliteration here. We're looking at the peace. Um, also, from once he speaks, his pers he gives you his perspective to understand what is going on and what you need to do. The next thing we see is his protection to keep us from all the arrows of the enemy. By the way, that doesn't mean that you don't come under attack. You will come under attack. This church will come under attack. But ultimately, he will preserve you in the midst of the attacks. The final thing on the list here is his provision to meet our needs. So I wanted to put this up because it might just give you a sense of where we're going. Um, whenever we get close to him, this is what kicks in. And this is what you and me should be seeking in his presence. Amen. Thanks, Jaleesa. So this morning, I want to look at his proclamations or his voice or his word in the midst of as you're coming out of a wilderness experience. I want to say this. If God is going to work in you and through you, you're going to have to be sensitive to and reliant upon his voice. That is right at the core of Christian living. It's a no-brainer. He knows we do not know. Um, he knows that he can, but we cannot. And it's real smart, therefore, for us to get close to him and listen to his counsel. Um, we need to hear his voice for our own personal spiritual edification. We need to hear his voice to know what to say to others. So we're talking this morning about God working in you and through you. But for God to work in you, you have to hear his voice. For God to work through you, you have to hear his voice. Um, we have a habit of sometimes thinking that we need to have words for every person we come in contact with and every situation that we're faced with. But the reality is we often do not have anything or any spiritual weight to give. Of, of any spiritual weight to give. I'll say that again. We have a habit of sometimes thinking that we need to have words for every person we come in contact with and every situation we're faced with. But the reality is we often do not have anything of any spiritual weight to give. Have you ever felt that? You're dealing with a situation you don't know what to say. You just don't know what to say. You, there's nothing there. After a wilderness, you become aware of the power of his voice. You become totally reliant upon his instruction to get you through a day. Jesus taught in Matthew 4.4, 4, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen? There are levels of intimacy with God. If your life is all go, if you are always running, if you do not have time to stop, be still, and listen to God, then you will struggle with hearing the voice of God and therefore grasping the will of God. Um, if you're not hearing the voice of God and grasping the will of God, then you have nothing to give to others. Does that make sense? Let me give you some practical nuggets about hearing from God. Number one, your heart must be open to hear from God. You must genuinely approach God with expectancy. Number two, the environment must be conducive for God to speak. The less distractions, the better. 
Number three, the scriptures should be integral to your communion with him. When you go into prayer, do you ever take your Bible? Do you ever bring the word of God when you're going into prayer? Like talk to him, maybe meditate upon him. And as he talks back to you, do you ever open your word and just say, Lord, speak? I urge you, when you go into the place of prayer, please bring your Bible. The wilderness is a habit of setting us aside from all the noise. It leaves us devoid of any human confidence. It causes us to give God a blank sheet. Amen? Amen. Or do you think you come out of the wilderness with all the words? <laughs> the end of this is that we are taken out of the picture and this becomes all about him. Isaiah 66 2 says this, To this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Do you tremble at his word? Do you fear God this morning? When you come out of a prolonged stripping process, you see how big God is and how small you are. You realize how foolish it is to depend upon your own feelings. He causes you to take him at his word. When you are purged of any confidence in self, it's no longer about your emotions or your thoughts or your ability or your talents or the power of your words, but rather it's all about the power of God's promises and his ability to keep them. Can I say that again? When you are purged of any confidence in self, it's no longer about your feelings or emotions, your thoughts, your ability, your talents, or the power of your words, but rather it is all about the power of God's promises and his ability to keep them. I have a question. Do you believe that God is omniscient? All-knowing. Do you believe that God knows everything? Do you know what that means? He knows everything that has happened. He knows everything that is happening, even this morning. And he knows everything that is about to happen. Do you believe that God is righteous? Do you know what that means? He does everything right. He cannot do wrong. Do you believe that God is omnipotent, all-powerful? Do you know what that means? He can do whatever he wants and no one can thwart him. Okay, so I've asked all these questions for a reason. And it brings me to something very, very important. Why then would you doubt what he tells you? Why would you question him? To get close to and fully take on board what the one who has complete unlimited knowledge is saying is a no-brainer. To get close to and fully take on board what the one who does everything right is saying is an absolute. To get close to and fully take on board what the one who has unmatched and unparalleled power is saying should require little thought. Psalm 29.4 says, The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Can you relate to that today? Doesn't matter what man says. It matters what God says. Ultimately, today, we're either governed by him or governed by ourselves. Charles Spurgeon said this, Beloved, I cannot tell you how it is that God's voice is so majestic, except from the fact that he is so mighty himself and that his words are like him. God's majestic, amen? His words are majestic. God is mighty, so his words are mighty. Let me say just a few things about the voice of God. The voice of God is authoritative because what he says goes. The voice of God has the power to create. It speaks things into existence. The voice of God is life-giving. The voice of God has power over the natural and the spiritual realm. The voice of God accomplishes great things. The voice of God is enlightening. 
The voice of God softens the hardened heart. The voice of God is life-changing. The voice of God can bring the dead to life. The voice of God has the power to destroy. I've said this, or I've heard it put like this. The voice of the Lord brings instruction, construction, and for those who fight it, it can bring destruction, which is a very sobering thing. We're talking about the one who at the beginning said, let there be light, and there was light. Listen to Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depths in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. That's strong language this morning. Do you believe that? When he speaks something, that's it. This all, again, begs a very serious question. Why then are we so slow to listen to this voice when God speaks? Romans 4.17 says, God calleth those things which, which be not as though they were. In other words, God's very command creates the outcome. The New King James Version says this, God calls those things which do not exist as though they did. God has the ability to create new things out of nothing. When God speaks, it's as good as done. It mightn't actually be happening, but if he said it's going to happen, it will happen. Do you realize when God calls you something you are not, you become what he says because he said it, even if you've not arrived there? God's words are creative. That's why it's so important when you come into the house of God. If God is speaking directly to you, you must receive it. You must believe it because then you become it. Do you understand? You, you have to be what God says you are. When God says, I'm going to bring it to pass, then guess what? He's going to bring it to pass. You know when it is God's thing, then there's no evidence but his word. How many times does he give you a promise when it looked impossible? It looked impossible. It's like, it's not going to happen. But if you were looking a blind man in the face or a dumb man in the face or you were looking at a dead man in a tomb and somebody told you that there was going to be a miracle happen, how would it feel in the natural? But can you imagine being at that tomb of Lazarus when the Lord said, Lazarus, come forth? What happened when he said, Lazarus, come forth? And when I was in Israel, um, I remember a Hebrew professor saying this, who was showing us, this was in Bethany. They took us to what they believe was the tomb of Lazarus. And he said there was a reason why Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Because if he hadn't named Lazarus' name, he said the whole graveyard would have come forth. That's how powerful the word of God is. When God gives you a promise, I'm telling you there's a power with that promise. There's a real power. Please know God sees things the way they will be, not just the way they currently are. After all, we're stuck in time. He lives in eternity. He knows the end from the beginning. We are looking at things from a vastly inferior vantage point to which God is. He is seeing the fulfillment of it, and we normally aren't. Like, when we look at the promises that God has given this church, and you look at the challenge that's before us, Today, it's like, how is it going to happen? God has given us promises about revival. How is it going to happen? Well, if God says it, guess what? Amen? Amen? If God says there's going to be a move in this reservation, no one can stop that. 
There's no demon, there's no devil, there's no human being can stop God. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? Or do you believe man has the, the ability to thwart the purposes of God? If he does think that, then he's, he's more blind than he realizes. That is why we often react against the promises of God. It's like, that doesn't make sense. So if God shows you something and he's speaking right directly to your heart, normally if you run with that in the natural, you're going to think you're going crazy. This is where he has to train us through deep testing experiences so that we take him at his word. By the way, this should encourage you to get close to him, stay close to him, and run to him for direction for everything in your life. So when God gives you a promise, how solid is it? How can Satan deal with the one who carries such power in his very words? Do you think the devil has power over God? Moses, in our passage this morning, came to the end of a very difficult 40-year wilderness experience. And of course, God was calling him here. At the age of 80 years of age, God commissioned him to be Israel's deliverer. What's Moses' response here? God's saying, you're the man. What's Moses' response? Yeah, I'm the man. I'm ready. I've got the words. I've got everything. I'm ready to see revival. Is that what Moses said? He said, oh Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither t hitherto for, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I'm slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Then God responds to him. Who has made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? And this is what he said. Now therefore go and I will be thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. If you hear what Moses was saying here, he didn't want it. He didn't want to do it, and he didn't want to say it. He didn't want to come to the fore. But after a 40-year wilderness, he didn't want to be the man. He didn't want to step forth. He didn't want to make it happen. He didn't want to speak even on God's behalf because he's like, who am I? I feel unworthy. I feel inadequate. I feel unable. God gives him a great assignment to deliver God's people from Egypt. You have to admit, what an incredible assignment. They're stuck in bondage. They're stuck in Egypt for years. And God says, I want you to lead my people out of bondage. What's his reply? He's not able. He's not equipped. He's got nothing to give. What a resume. Has God brought you to that place where you feel like you have nothing to give? Do you feel weak? Do you feel unworthy? Do you feel inadequate? Have you got to the place of surrender? It's a place where God comes to the fore and gets all the glory. Hallelujah. By the way, in those 40 years, there's no doubt God was speaking to Moses. Now it was time for God to speak through Moses. Mm -hmm. So, it, when you're going through those difficult times, God is speaking to you. But it gets to the stage where then God wants to speak through you. He wants to speak to other people. There's people around you that don't know God's truth. There's people around you that need to hear the voice of God. But if you think that you've got all the answers, a lot of the time God can't use you. The potency of this arrangement was not therefore found in the greatness of Moses' words, but in the fact that God would speak through him. That's because Moses was just given what he received. Later on, in Exodus 14, 13, Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he 
will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. This was not simply Moses' hope or Moses' words of encouragement. This was God speaking. Moses simply relayed what was going to happen. This is what he's looking from you and me. This is where he's trying to take us. We need to recognize how this looks on the ground. Israel surrounded by natural and spiritual impossibilities here. Israel found themselves at the Red Sea. What was in front of them was the sea. There's no way they were getting across the Red Sea. There was just three million Israelites and no boats to take those three million across the water. You had mountains on either side. There's no way that they're getting over those mountains. Behind them, you've got Pharaoh's army, the Egyptians. The Egyptians are about to wipe them out. And God gives a word to Moses. Sometimes we think what we're going through looks pretty impossible. Looks pretty dark. Looks pretty hopeless. Well, you have to say this didn't look good. But when God speaks, the playing field changes. The natural hindrances must go. The spiritual hindrances must go. Why? Because it is time for God to manifest his glory. And by the way, it's time for the devil to get out of the way. Exodus 14, 16 tells us, but lift, God's talking to Moses, lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. This is the way it works when man is truly partnered with God. God gives the instruction, often explaining what will happen as a consequence of his command. Then man obeys without delay or complaint and God keeps his word and implements what he promised. Ultimately, he wants you to be an ambassador for him. He wants you to be his voice in this hour. He wants you to be a channel that he can speak through and work through. Isaiah 55, 10, and I'm coming to a close, says this, For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, and it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereto I sent it. Amen? Amen. When God speaks, guess what? Things happen. Yeah. Amen. Do you believe that this morning? Yeah. The one who spoke this all into being has the ability to speak to you and to speak through you and supernatural things happen. Think about this. When you speak to that sinner, God is speaking to that sinner. When you speak to that backslider, God himself is speaking to that backslider. When you speak to that believer who's struggling, God is speaking to that believer that is struggling. Isn't that potent? Now, what do you think the effect of that is? When it's not you, but it's him. It's very sobering. The other thing is that when you declare the warning, declare the warning of the Lord, and that message is rejected, then they come under instant judgment. Because it's not the human being, it's not the man of God that's speaking, it's God speaking. Does that make sense? That's the potency of the voice of God. You know, I told you when I came into this service this morning, God woke me up really early. Really early. But he spoke to me through his word. And honestly, I think next Sunday I'm going to speak on this passage because we're going to be talking about protection. 
And I think even it might be good for me to read what I got this morning. Maybe you want to turn to Psalm 91. The reason I'm saying this is, I got into the prayer meeting this morning. Uh, Cameron Brumman started to pray. And he started to pray word for word what I just read when, I got, when the Lord woke me up at like 5.55 or 6 o'clock this morning. This was my reading. And Cam right or wrong, Cameron? He started, to, he started to quote this in his prayer. Now listen to it in the light of what's happened this morning, by the way. Listen to it. Because this is, was the promise he gave me. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrows that flyeth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon, shalt thou trample under feet because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Isn't that potent? That was my reading this morning. I come into a prayer meeting and the first person who starts to pray starts to pray that word for word. What, what, what do you take from that? What do you take from that yourself? God is speaking and guess what? God will keep his word. Because the creator of the universe, the one that created the sun and the moon, the order, the cycles, the harvest, the human body, the male and female, the one who created all this order, put the eyes in the correct place, the mouth in the correct place. Honestly, I'm going to tell you something strange this morning. Back about five days ago, I was lying in the bath. Honestly, just thinking about the Lord. And I know you might think this is crazy. But I kind of I lifted my feet up and I had my feet on the side of the bath. And I'm looking at my feet and just how all the toes are in the right place. And I'm like... How could that happen from a big bang? Like, the, the, what's, what's right at the bottom of your body actually allows you to walk. But that the, I mean, if you didn't have your big toe, you would lose your balance. Think about the order. The one, there was one who spoke that into being. He spoke and Adam and Eve were created. That's the God that lives within us this morning. That's the God who's speaking this morning. The big challenge for you and me is, do we listen to his voice or do we listen to another voice? I'm telling you, I don't know anything else to do but listen to his voice. Amen. I've trusted his voice from, I was a child. I've trusted his voice when I'm on the mountaintop. I've trusted his voice when I'm in the valley. I've trusted his voice because I can't trust any other human voice or I can't trust my own voice. If you have a trust in your feelings, your voice, you have a trust in your thoughts, 
listen, you're not getting it. But if your trust is him, I'm telling you, you can go out here with confidence that as he lays something upon your heart and you relay that thing, that his word will not return unto him void. But it's going to accomplish what he has sent it to accomplish. So instead of you worrying and trying to see that sinner, how's that sinner going to repent? That's not your issue. Your issue is simply to deliver what God has given to you and trust the power of his voice. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you that you are not silent. In the midst of the trials, in the midst of the battles, your voice is still being heard, O oh God. And Lord, we do what we want to do with your voice. We either embrace your voice or we fight your voice. Your Holy Spirit has a way of doing things. You have a way of speaking. You're a God of order. Lord, like I started the service this morning deliberately, I said that you do things decently and in order. Decently and in order. That's why when we know that God is moving. He does things decently and in order. Because that's the God we serve. The devil is all about chaos, division and destruction. But our God is all about love and unity and life and power. Lord, we thank you for your presence here. Without your presence, we're lost. Without your voice, we are directionless. Lord, would you continue to speak? Would you continue to move? In Jesus' precious name, amen.